Welcome to the What's Under the Hood podcast. Today I have Rory O'Sullivan, who represents Moltex, has one of their designs planned for New Brunswick, which is our uh, easterly province. And uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about why we need it. And uh, Rory is here, and I'm going to get him to kind of do a little sales pitch for it, maybe one minute or so, and um, and then we'll get into a bit of his background. Okay, Rory, so welcome, and uh, uh, go for it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi, Rick. Uh, great to be here. So, um, as you know, we are developing a small modular reactor that's specifically focused on recycling spent fuel from existing reactors. So we're taking the spent fuel from the commercial reactors around the world, starting off in Canada, and typically it's sitting at the existing sites. We can take that, recycle it, convert it into new fuel for our reactor, put it into our reactor, and use that to create more clean energy. So our pitch to a a local community is we're bringing jobs and clean energy and we we will leave less waste behind than we had before. Whereas the other SMRs are coming on with jobs and clean energy and great technology pitches, but they will leave behind more nuclear waste than there was before. So that's that's the main aim. What we're trying to do is reduce the waste legacy for nuclear power so we can enable the bigger nuclear renaissance that we're all hoping for. Okay, that's an excellent summary, and I, uh, that immediately um, brings up a question in my mind um, about the suitability of for certain geographic locations. And, uh, for example, Canada happens to have a number of reactors uh, in Ontario. And um, so Canada, I guess, in the broad sense, is a, good loca- is a good place to start. Would it be sensible to say that this reactor should be purchased by people who want to deal with waste? I would say it should be purchased by people who have a waste liability. Uh, okay. So people who have that existing challenge on their hands, which is waste owners. So there's not many, you know, it's very few uh, around the world. It's, you know, go- organ- government organizations or subsidiaries of government typically that, that have that waste liability. In the US, it's a mixture of the Department of Energy and the utilities, but that's really the focus. It's a very targeted market to, to deal with a specific issue. Okay, yeah. So have you started any dialogue with them about it? We absolutely have. So uh, Ontario has uh, about 93% of the spent fuel in Canada, which is enough to power about six gigawatts of our reactors for 60 years. Um, And so a very very important market for us. And we have a very good relationship with Ontario Power Generation and the OPG have uh, contributed a million dollars towards the development funding to demonstrate their support. And uh, and they're an interested customer. But um, we are in New Brunswick first and they want to see us successfully build this in New Brunswick and and demonstrate its economics and the potential. And uh, and then it's on to Ontario and, and, and the U.S. and the world. Okay. I did this a little bit out of order. I, I wonder if you could give me a little bit of a, a background on yourself, just a, a short background, a minute or two, um, just to give us an idea of how you ended up in, in this position. Sure. So, yeah, I uh, studied mechanical engineering in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and also in France, Linz at Lyon, a double degree. And um, I was very interested in energy, started working on a wind farm in Ireland and pretty quickly realized that wind is not going to solve our problems. And and I was, uh, like most Irish people, anti-nuclear at the time for the usual reasons of safety, cost and waste. And so I was a bit dismayed by energy, went and worked in London in construction and project management and did quite well and worked my way up there. And um, uh, at one point I came across the concept of molten salt reactors or liquid fuel reactors. And I got completely enthralled by them, realizing that they have the potential to deal with all three of those issues. And so I spent a lot of time studying nuclear physics, um, you know, studying in the evenings for a few years and uh, set up a company to do some feasibility studies on molten salt reactors, got some UK government funding um, and then ended up coming across Moltex because was had just come about the inventor just come up with the idea and so that team i had developed there for doing that study we merged in with the founder of multex and 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 took it from there and uh i've been in canada since 2018 uh building the team and and progressing things which has been a lot of fun okay yeah um 
I, when I started this uh, podcast, my goal was to uh, educate the more, I guess, um, experienced or maybe students who have an engi- are working on engineering and to try and also, um, as an example of somebody who's uh, kind of a, I guess, a n- novice for sure, uh, I've studied myself, but never gone to school in nuclear energy. Um, uh, so, so I'm thinking that in a way I represent what the general public should be um, aiming at understanding. So, so that's that's one of my goals, and and um, so I'm going to be getting into a little bit of the de- detail of the design uh, and asking you a few questions in that regard. Yeah. So New Brunswick um, has a can do. And I'm sure one of their uh, reasons for accepting your proposal was, of course, to deal with their waste. So do you find that you'll be tweaking, I guess, the design to meet can-do type of waste? So we have, um, maybe I'll come back a bit and just talk about why Canada before that. But we we looked at uh, lots of different markets and, and Canada came uh, the summary is Canada came out on top because it has a good regulatory environment there's a need for clean energy and there are multiple technology neutral customers Uh, that's the the main framework um and uh, the it didn't make a huge difference of what reactor type was in the region as long as they were oxide fuel can do is a little bit harder than light water because there's lower fissile content in the fuel than light water reactors which is the dominant uh, reactor type in the u.s and, and most countries so what we design for Canada is essentially harder than what we do for LWR fuel. So if we can make it work for Candus, it's 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 going to work for for elsewhere. So the reactor design is designed for both. The fuel output of either will be the same. On the recycling process called Watts, waste to stable salts, the process is designed to take both. Okay. Um, and so we designed that configuration in. The front end will be quite different because with light water fuel, we have very different size fuel assemblies. The light water ones are several meters long. Candu bundles are a foot long. So the, the front mechanical handling is, is quite different. You have to chop up the LWR fuels, but the actual process is exactly the same. Uh, and also, I guess, uh, discussing about there, there's two major reactor uh, designs that you're dealing with. One is to... Um, prepare the fuel, am I correct? And the other one is to um, burn it. Am I, does that sound reasonable? The, so the reactor, I guess, is to burn it, but it efficiency is it as fuel. And then the um, the other facility we're developing is Watts. It's it's a recycling facility. Um, so in some is, that, you- is that a reactor, though? In the in the nuclear, we use the word reactor for nuclear fission reactor. In the chemical industry, they would call that a reactor. There is a chemical reaction process happening there. Um, we don't refer to it as a reactor. We call it as a recycling facility. But okay, so the recycling something. facility doesn't involve fission or does it? No, 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 no. Uh, what process are you in the um, building stage? Like, I know you probably have it on paper right now. Uh, yeah, it's a paper reactor, as they say. As I like to say, it's a it's a lot of paper reactor. Um, we have uh, yeah, th- they've done extensive studies over the years, um, and then we've really now we're at bench benchmark um, bench testing on all the different novel components. So we're building on a lot of established uh, test reactors and various other experiments that have gone on in the labs. And we've done our own smaller tests of the various different systems to validate our, the newer parts of our product. Um, but in, And then in parallel, and we'll be scaling them up over the next few years until the main demonstration facility in New Brunswick. And that will be at the beside the existing Candu reactor at the Point LePro site, where uh, New Brunswick Power, our lead customer, are doing groundworks and um, boreholes and test sites and have, have leveled the, the ground already. I see. Uh, so, in terms of a demo uh, demonstration facility, um, will that be essentially the end product? That will be the end product, yes. Um, and in terms of the demonstrations along the way, one we're building on existing the molten salt reactor test reactors that happened, and and multiple other you know, similar reactors like sodium fast reactors that have that have gone on around the world. And our testing program, as I said, will be scaled up tests all the all the way because nuclear is so heavily regulated you can't 
you can't have anything novel in the reactor essentially you have to test and validate every sure. bit of equipment that you're going to put in and has to be already tested in the environment especially if it has a, a safety function um but the first reactor is going to be scaled back at a lower power so we're okay. designing the facility to 500 megawatts so the, the, the target design is as close to 500 megawatt electric as possible but we're scaling back the first one to 300 megawatt electric to give ourselves some safety margin and that size fits in well with the local grid as well. So it'll be the first of a kind that's designed. It's, it's going to be installed at full size like the others, mm -hmm. but the, the power output will be reduced slightly. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, if you're going to be producing a, a reactor that demonstrates, I guess what I'm getting at is a, a, it's a bit unclear about its purpose with regard to providing local electricity. So there's really two business models. Um, we have the, the recycling facility, which takes the spent fuel, converts it into fuel for our reactor. Um, and then in our kind of economics, our reactor runs the, as an independent business like any other reactor. It would buy fuel from the Watts so that fuel facility and produces clean energy onto the local grid like any other nuclear reactor facility. Okay. I mean, there's a difference on the storage, which I can come back to later, but um, absolutely, it's a dual proposition. We can solve a clean energy challenge and the waste challenge at the same time. Very good. And uh, so it's not necessarily a hybrid, but it, it most likely will be. Is that does it make sense? Uh, a hybrid in what sense? I guess a hybrid in, in the sense it has more than one purpose. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, so electricity, of course. Uh, uh, being high in the list of priorities and uh, waste burning as the other pr main priority. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, so, um, so other possible hybrid uses that 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 interests me as well. I have let, let's uh, just explore that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, so th there are there are a lot of. Um other uses for nuclear. First of all, generally at a macro level, we've only perceived nuclear to be uh, electricity producer. So it's it's now commercially only available around the world as an electricity producer. Um, in China, they have a couple of other uses like uh, industrial heat. But as we decarbonize, nuclear needs to have a much bigger role than just electricity pr pr production because it produces a lot of high temperature heat. And the, heat, the, the, heat, the temperature of the heat varies on the reactor design. The commercial ones today are around 300 degrees Celsius, can do or light water reactors. But the, the, more, the modern advanced reactors like high temperature gas, molten salt like us, or sodium, uh, have output temperatures between sort of 450, 500 and up to 650 Celsius. And this really opens up many new possibilities. Um, one of them is hydrogen. Uh, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen lately. If you have high temperature heat and electricity, you can use high temperature electrolysis to produce more cost-effective uh, clean hydrogen. Um, of course, you can just produce it with just pure low temperature electrolysis uh, with electricity. But if you have high temperature as well, you can increase efficiency of the process. So that's a big use that a lot of um, nuclear reactors are really focusing on. Some of our competitors or other technologies are, are really looking at that as a prime market. What, and, and that works for us. We can produce high, we produce high temperature heat, so that's viable. What we're focusing on is, of course, the waste, but also the ability to use the facility as a peaking plant. So what we've done is we've coupled the reactor to a thermal energy storage facility in the same way that the, the concentrated solar power facility, this is the one where you have rings of mirrors reflecting the sun into a, up to a tower where they have molten salt at the top of the tower. That molten salt gets hot, goes down into large tanks of, of hot molten salt, and then they can use that hot molten salt to produce electricity constantly and not with the varying sun. And that's quite economical in very hot regions like in the desert. Well, we've taken that um, salt storage technology that they use with solar and coupled it to our high temperature nuclear. And so what we can do then is the heat out of the reactor can now be stored in these large tanks of molten salt for whatever duration the local customer, the, the local grid, the local customer needs. So for example, if we have a 500 megawatt reactor, we could store the heat in these tanks for 16 hours a day. And then if you have a steam turbine and generator set at three times the capacity, so 
1500 megawatts you could take the heat from the 16 hours of storage and heat from eight hours of the reactor running and you could run that uh, facility at three times the capacity of the reactor for a third of the day. So instead of having a nuclear reactor running base load, so that's you know 95% capacity, you would now have a much larger facility operating at a peaking plant at around 30, 35% capacity, like a gas plant would. Okay. And yeah. This is a bit of a mind shift uh, change for the role of nuclear, but really, you, you can have nu- high temperature nuclear can be a peaking plant to implement to complement intermittent renewables. That's great. And that would be um, on the same premises as, as the rest of the plant, right? Yeah, you'd want it because the, the heat is easy to transfer around. So you'd want it on this close, reasonably close. So you store yeah. the heat, which is easy and co- very cost effective. And then you transport the electricity on the grid because you can move electricity quite easily, but you can't store it easily. So I just out of curiosity, um, what kind of challenges does New Brunswick have with, um, with peaking? Like... Um, what when do those extremes happen um mostly in the heating it's winter heating and new brunswick is all electric heating it's electric baseboard heating and it's 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 moving to um heat pumps but it's it's electric going to electric um the peaks are in winter and but new brunswick has quite a varied uh electricity generation fleet um there's some hydro in the province there's some hydro uh, a lot of hydro in quebec um, and the problem is that's not available all year round. But the New Brunswick really so it has some peaking capability already. It really needs new base load to take over from the coal and support local regions around and the increased demand. Um, so there, there will be some flexibility in peaking to this plant. But as we, we say, we sell a fixed reactor and recycling design. And the customer can have whatever configuration of storage and uh, peaking facility that they want. So some, like a hydrogen producer, will not want any peaking. They'll just want base load. Mm-hmm. New Brunswick wants a little bit of variability, a little bit of peaking, uh, but they can decide that very late. We can even start off with a base load configuration and then add more storage and more turbines on later as the local grid gets more renewables and needs that more, um, the, the higher peaking backup. I know this might be an early stage to um, explain this part of it, but if you're going to be creating hydrogen, there's a different, couple of different schools of thought or several schools of thought about whether you should use high temperature, whether you should use elect, uh, electrolysis. Um, uh, what, have you chosen uh, the method? No, we, we haven't, and, and we wouldn't choose a method. We would partner with a company who, who would use our heat. So okay. we would supply heat and or electricity, and then someone who knows a lot more about hydrogen production than us would, would uh, choose the most effective um, oh, okay, yeah. method. All right, that's, yeah, that's we're not we're not going to we're not going to get into the hydrogen business. It's, yeah, that's a specialty, people already and that's yeah. just up to the, yeah. Uh, then when it comes to the time where you're ready for that, then you could pick and choose what kind of partner you want. That's right. And, and technologies are evolving. But uh, at the moment, it looks like high temperature electrolysis would, would be the best, I think, quite obviously, because it's the highest efficient that's there available. But um, those technologies are still being commercialized now, um, and, and they're making good progress, but there's still a, still a long way to go. Some, there was even some speculation that uh, hydrogen is hard to manage because of its um, uh, ability to um, leak into the atmosphere uh, because it's such a small atom and um, it can actually go through steel and uh, and when it does leak it affects the ozone layer apparently and this is what I've heard and it may grow less popular if that is ever studied in enough detail uh, to discover whether it is harmful to whether it's helping climate change or not uh, have you got an opinion on that uh, I have lots of opinions on that. I don't, I don't know if it's worth delving into that. Um, what I will say, the yeah. nuclear industry needs to be ready to take the lion's share of the decarbonization mm-hmm. because many of the other technologies are uh, un- unproven um, to be able to reliably displace fossil fuels. Nuclear energy in its form, in its currently commercially available form today, 
has demonstrated the ability to take over from fossil fuels. If you look at Sweden or France, nuclear power is the only technology that's already demonstrated a scale up per capita fast enough to scale up fast enough to meet climate change. Um, so, you know, the new nuclear power like ours can do even more than today. So we've just got to be ready. Uh, and the challenge, you know, today we're looking at new technologies, but the challenge for the nuclear sector isn't going to be technology development. It's going to be how fast can we scale reliably at the right price point for the price that we said we would deliver at. Okay, good. excellent. Yeah. Now, as far as the um, actual design, I wanted to get a little bit more into that. Um, First of all, I thought maybe we'd start by do a bit of a comparison because from what I understand, your design is quite different from some of the leading contenders like Terrestrial Energy, um, maybe Thoracon, and uh, uh, even um, the BWRX. Um, and uh, actually there's, in terms of molten salt reactors, I think Thoracon and uh, maybe Elysium, but Elysium's changed its name. I've forgotten the new name now. Uh, and there's also two different kinds of salt, uh, fluoride and chloride, right? Um, and you've uh, chosen chloride, I believe. Yes, yeah. And, and maybe you could explain some of the, maybe some of the differences to the reactors I mentioned and, um, and uh, what's your rationale for choosing chloride? Uh, yeah, so um, the, 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 re the main difference with commercial reactors or most of the, the light water reactors <laughs> is that they have solid, little solid pellets of uranium. So they're, you know, the size of your pinky finger, pinky nail. Um, and, and, they, and there's maybe hundreds of them in a pin. And then they have high pressure water going by those pins that take away the heat. Well, we have the same pins as today's commercial reactors, but instead of the solid pellets of uranium, we have our liquid fuel salt. So we use partly use uranium. It's the same fission process. We also have all of the transuranic. So everything on the periodic table above uranium is also in our fuel because we're taking converted spent fuel. So every, almost everything that was in spent fuel is carried across into our fuel. Um, and it, it's liquid at, at all times in operation. And what this does is it immediately sort of the concept of a nuclear meltdown doesn't apply. And the hazard with conventional nuclear doesn't apply. The hazard with con conventional nuclear is that solid pellet of uranium can get slightly too hot and it will melt down. And then you have all of the high pressure radioactive gases that are built up in that pressure. They will explode out of the pellet at once. And then you have high pressure water going through there and that high pressure water turns to steam and ex explodes out even further. So it expels the radioactive gases out into the atmosphere. Now, the technologies today, the commercial reactors have done an excellent job at maintaining this and they have uh, an impeccable safety record. Nuclear power is the safest form um, of generation out there, but that comes at very clever engineering to maintain everything running at the right temperature ranges and conditions. So in our reactor, those radioactive fission product gases don't exist as gases. They're not there in an accident to be released. They're, they come off as, as salts in a different, different chemical form. The gases that do come off are taken away steadily so that the hazard is reduced. And in addition, there's no high pressure coolant to disperse any releases. There's no mechanism for any high pressure buildup in any scenario. So that's the fundamental safety uh, change and advantage that, that actually almost all molten salt reactors bring. Um, but coming back to our uniqueness is this liquid fuel in pins. The second advantage, there's two other advantages. The, the second one is corrosion. So we can control the chemistry of the fuel salt in the fuel pin. And we do this by adding a sacrificial anode. We add a, zirconium, a bit of zirconium metal in the fuel pin. So essentially what happens, this is massively oversimplifying the chemistry, but the fuel salt will, will corrode the zirconium before it'll corrode the, um, the, 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 the metals that are in the cladding. I and see. So, 
we we have very solid chemistry basis for this. This is some of our unique patterns, but the tests that we have done so far have shown shiny stainless steel at 1,000 hours at temperature. But we still have lots of work to go to do more and more uh, tests in various other environments that are more like the real uh, in reactor environment. The third um, advantage is we can have almost any level of impurities in our fuel salts and we can still operate safely. With today's reactors, you have to have a very, very high purity fuel to get that little pellet uh, to, to make sure it's, 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 it's safe and stays solid in all accident environments. Well, because we have this kind of safer environment, we can have any level of impurities, almost any level of impurities in the fuel salt. And that's why we can take converted spent fuel much easier than has previously been possible before. So when historically, you know, big governments looked at reprocessing technologies, they needed very, very complex multi-billion dollar facilities that would create high purity material that would go into, uh, as these solid pellets, into fuel pins. Well, we don't, we don't need that level of separation high purity, so we can have a much simpler facility that will create our fuel um, at a much lower cost and safer because we're not doing the same level of separations as the other facilities are. So uh, that's the main get, kind of differences. Yep. I was going to say, let's get the name out there because uh, it's SSRW, correct? That's right, yes. The Stable Salt Reactor Waste Burner. So the Waste Burner bit's obvious. And the Stable Salt comes from the fact that we have this stable salt so it's a it's a liquid fuel in pins and the fuel is stable whereas every other molten salt reactor out there circulates that fuel salt through the core and around heat exchangers cool. and that was our unique patents is is the ability to have the fuel contained in pins and we validated that's viable whereas all of the others circulate a third of the periodic table through the whole uh, the whole plant so if you were going to describe these you call them pins. Um, are they anything like pressure tubes? Um, they, there's almost no pressure in them. So there's a sort of a non-return valve, special vent at the top that allows pressures to gases to release, decayed gases to release after time, yeah. uh, after after a holdup. Um, uh, are they pressure tubes in terms of certain regulations and codes and standards? Yes, they do fall into a pressure tubes in terms of yeah and the as, thing is as me codes. also the calandria that we, we we have in a can do is there something equivalent to a calandria um there is a, if a cut through of our reactor looks just like a sodium fast reactor oh, okay so we have a pool of coolant like almost every sodium fast reactor we have fuel assemblies that come in and out vertically like almost every sodium fast reactor and like most light water reactors um, and so we have a, a, a vessel that holds the coolant and that will be a, a pressure vessel according to ASME standards um, are there two kinds of radioactive material. does that mean there's two kinds of salt that exist at the same time so there's the nuclear fuel we've talked about yeah. and to take away the heat from those fuel assemblies we could use any coolant we could use high pressure water high pressure gas sodium lead uh, or molten salt oh and our top candidates were actually lead and molten salt um, because uh, and molten salt was the top candidate because if it's good at taking away heat, we can control the chemistry because that coolant is a non-nuclear molten salt. So we can get a high grade uh, one that, that won't, won't corrode and we can control the chemistry in the same way. But importantly, if we have a, a, a fuel pin failure and fuel leaks into the coolant, it's miscible and you now have a safer situation. So you have a less critical core, and we can design the ability to have a certain number of fuel pins failed, even though that's extremely unlikely because the fuel is at such a low pressure, there's there's there's, there's very minimal reason for them to leak, unlike today's reactors where they are very high pressure. Interesting, yeah. So uh, each one of those has its um, challenges, and I was going to say regulatory challenges, but I guess if you had to choose one, that was physically manageable, which one seems most likely? Um, which one seems most likely in terms of- As opposed of, uh, to, you know, you had lead there and you had um, molten salt. Yeah. Um, what? Well, 
we, we def- without doubt the molten salt coolant is is the most effective for our design um it is compact it leads to a compact design as it is very good at taking heat away it's a very good heat carrier and uh, enables overall a, a very safe design so the the part the that the part that manages the fission is that the part with the chloride so both are actually chloride okay yeah so we've always had a chloride fuel salt. A couple of years ago, we uh, evolved the design to have a chloride coolant um, because it was better compatibility, better um, temperature operating range, mm-hmm. and better certainty of um, thermophysical properties under all conditions. And they're, they have to be separated and, and, and sealed off from one another. Is that correct? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know that they have to be, but... E- Yes, we, we want the fuel and coolant separately, uh, se- separate. Um, mm-hmm. If you merge them, we would look like a conventional molten salt reactor, which has all the, the conventional corrosion challenges of, of having a third of the periodic table going going through your circuit. So it's it's probably doable, but it's um, it's, it's a lot of uh, validation work to demonstrate that. So no, we want them separate. We want the coolant to be to be clean and nuclear free, so it can it doesn't contaminate all of your other uh, components. Um, you know who Jeremy Whitlock is, correct? I do indeed. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine you've had some discussion with him, or at least his organization. Uh, yeah, because he's our Canadian expert on the can do, and he became um, kind of a prominent person with regulations from uh, was it Switzerland? Is that where he is, or Geneva? He, he, he's in the International Atomic Energy Association, which is based in Vienna, Austria. Vienna, okay, that's it. Yeah, um, and uh, so he deals with uh, proliferation concerns, and um, and I'm sure that, that, that you've discussed this in the past about plutonium and making, uh, making the, the waste less dangerous, uh, less uh, proliferation, um, manageable, um, and um, maybe you could just go into a little bit about why this is a good reactor for that purpose. Yeah, sure. So um, we do have a program through the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to interact with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IEA, to ensure we're incorporating safeguards by design at the outset, at the earliest stages of design to make sure we are um, designing the, the, the safest, most secure uh, facility possible and getting their input as early as possible. So we've had quite an open dialogue with Jeremy and the team there um, to sh- explain to them what we're thinking and get their input as uh, they're essentially um, uh, a regulator, really, are I- imposing their requirements on, on Canada and other nations. Um, so that's been good open dialogue. Um, the as we progress we will be following international best practices to ensure we're doing this in line with cnsc and iea protocols um the the reprocessing uh, ha- has been very controversial in the past and typically that has been the case because the usually the intent of the facility is to create pure plutonium and uh, obviously pure plutonium is is uh, can be used as a in in weapons um, and so we, you know, the human race, want to avoid the, the creation of plutonium. The, our facility uh, cannot create pure plutonium. The specifically designed, because the reactor doesn't need this high purity, the Watts recycling facility doesn't need to create pure plutonium at any stage. And in fact, it can't produce pure plutonium. If, you, if a bad actor wanted to come along and use our facility to make pure plutonium, it wouldn't be possible. They would need to go and build a conventional uh, facility or another facility to, to, to reprocess further the materials and, and do that. Um, so that's the, the kind of the main technology uh, attribute. But the, the most important bit here is the plutonium is located in spent fuel. It's in all spent fuel. And... After it goes through our reactor, it will be destroyed. So the plutonium and the materials that are converted into energy in the reactor, it's Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, we are turning matter into energy. 
So there is a lot less plutonium at the end than there will be uh, at the start. So when yeah. our 60 years of operation has, has gone, we have destroyed a lot of plutonium. Uh, there is still some left because the spent fuel that's sitting in our core at the end of the 60 years, when we shut the reactor down, that's got to be disposed of like at other spent fuel um, or go into another reactor and you could keep burning that, burning that and destroying that plutonium again. But over the 60 years, as we create clean energy, we are destroying that plutonium. And that's really important to remember that is what are we going to leave future generations? Are we going to bury it in the ground and a future war could dig it up and, and use it? Or are we going to try and destroy it and get rid of it now as much as we can? And this technology overall has a significant proliferation benefit because we're destroying it. Well, that brings up a good, interesting point, too, about uh, what do you do? Uh, do you need a ge deep geological repository still? Uh, you're helping at least uh, um, ease the, uh, the public's con uh, concerns um, when, they, when you know that it's being used up and... Uh, and the lifespan is much shorter. The The time that that radiation is a danger is in hundreds of years. Was that what, how you would describe it? So the nuclear fission process produces um, uh, fission products, which are mostly a couple of hundred years uh, before they're decayed back to natural. There's a couple of outliers that have longer uh, half-lives. Um, and so for that reason, and for the fact that there's still spent fuel at the end of the reactor that we have to deal with. Um, a deep geological repository is still required. So we are not saying you can eliminate this problem of nuclear waste altogether, but we can significantly reduce it and reduce the size of these facilities and the environmental impact of these facilities. That's what the intent is as we progress our design and, and, and get better data, we can validate that. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to, to validate it. There's a lot of work. Has, good work has gone into the deep geologic repositories. So if you look at Canada as a as a market, Canada has a has a plan. It has a solid plan on how to deal with um, deal with waste. There's a nuclear waste management organization that is plan, moving forward with the D, DGR, and they absolutely need to, and, and, and we are full supporters of that program. Um, because whatever happens, we're going to need a DGR. Our, what we're aiming to do is make their make their lives easier or making it a bit smaller. So um, th there's a, a physical problem of and political problem of transporting the, the different kinds of waste. Like there's about three, they usually classify waste into three categories from what I understand. There's the, there's the uh, most, uh, I guess, uh, dangerous level, which is usually the smallest that, and then there's the middle and then there's the, um, more like things that uh, are disposable that you would never want to use again. Um, so, um, so I guess when you consider that, and you consider the opposition, like for example, I'll give you an example: the um, the steam generators at the Candu plants in in Ontario, especially. I, I'm thinking of Bruce because I got a tour of Bruce recently, and uh, the steam generators are stored in a warehouse, rather like they. They don't, they, they haven't uh, t initiated, they've tried once apparently to have some steam generators sent overseas to have it recycled, basically, the, the metal. And um, uh, so they had opposition and that's why they chose to keep it on site. Um, do, you, do you see that as a, like, uh, I guess that's par part of your, business plan is to make sure the regulatory pathway is enables this transport of this kind of um, waste? Well, we um, our, our model is to really reduce the waste legacy issue. So if you look at New Brunswick, for example, um, the spent fuel from the Candu reactor there, which is about 650, 700 megawatts, is enough for us to power our reactor for 60 years. The spent fuel from that reactor is enough to power our reactor, which would be 300 megawatts for 60 years. We don't need any other fuel imported onto site. Everything we need is already sitting in those waste stockpiles. Mm -hmm. That's good. No new enriched uranium, no new halo. Uh, so that from, like, maybe I'll come back to energy security uh, in, a, in a minute on that point. But in terms of transport, we don't need anything transported on. 
and we don't need to move that spent fuel off the site and transport oh, okay. the country. Yeah. So, but and the model is that we turn that high level waste fuel into mostly intermediate level waste, but certainly reduce uh, significantly reduce the amount of high level waste that in the end does need to be transported off site. The intent is that a large volume of that will be intermediate level waste, which is much shorter lived than um, than than was before. Okay, so um, having a partnership seems to be critical here, like the the uh, can do uh, plant and yours have a relationship. And if you were going to help Ontario, you would likely build another facility in Ontario. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we we would. Um lots of reactors because there's a lot of spent fuel there and, and Ontario needs a lot of clean energy. Mm-hmm. So we see ourselves as being part of the new nuclear mix. We see ourselves as being the one that can help deal with the nuclear waste issue, but also providing a chunk of the clean energy. It's six, you know, six gigawatts or more is what we predict is we, we can we can get from the spent fuel in Ontario based on the fuel that will come out of the has and will come out of the existing candus. If there's more nuclear power and more spent fuel from those small modular reactors or new can do's or whatever it is, we that's more market share for us. That's more spent fuel that we can power more reactors with and create more clean energy with. So yeah, so um, I guess translating that is that you will not be reprocessing can- uh, Ontario fuel. Um, you will be if you're going to do Ontario, you're going to build plants in Ontario. Yeah. Yeah, the intention is not to use the New Brunswick recycling facility to recycle uh, Ontario spent fuel. We would likely have facilities in Ontario, uh, but we haven't got to the details of, is that one regionally in the middle of the province? Is it a couple spread out that we'll we'll, um, we'll, we'll work on as as time progresses? Yeah, an interesting thing about what I've uh, learned about the can-dos is that they typically, uh, they have units of four, eight, uh, even 16 reactors in one location. Um, do you see that the Moltex will be doing numerous reactors in one location? It really varies regionally. Um, we typically, it would make sense to have the reactor and the recycling facility watts near existing reactors. Um where the spent fuel already is to minimize movement. Um, and so we're not looking at the industrial heat market, for example, long distances away from spent fuel. Our focus is, as we talked about earlier, customers that have spent fuel issue. Um, in the UK, all of the fuel cycle work is all done at Sellafield and there's a rail network from all the reactor facilities. So you would have the recycling facility watts around there, and then you could have your re- reactors, our reactors, anywhere throughout the country. Um, in the U.S., uh, you might have uh, the Watts facilities regionally across the country, perhaps located where there's a grouping of of of, uh, of reactors already, and then you could have the reactors spread across wherever they're needed across the states that they're, they're needed. Yeah, um, and uh, places that have coal, I think uh, I uh, heard as part of that our previous podcast you did, where you agreed that if you can reuse the coal facility in some way that you could um, take advantage of that. I've uh, I've heard people who know more about this say than me say um, the one thing that's harder to license than a nuclear facility is new power lines um, because getting new uh, power lines uh, licensed is just is just very very challenging in today's environment because most places are heavily populated. Um, so one of the big assets and, and, and value that a coal facility can bring is the, the, the just the grid connectivity. Right. The turbines can also be very valuable, especially as the the steam conditions on a coal facility are identical to what we would be producing. I see. So you, if the if the um, turbines are you know not old, uh, they could be they could be reused. Mm-hmm. And there has been a lot of new and, new coal. And with regard to New Brunswick, I, I know that Ontario managed to. Um, phase out coal. That's one of the things we brag about, I guess, in terms of why nuclear was really beneficial. Um, but um, they still have coal plants in New Brunswick. 
they have one coal facility. Okay, one. Well, okay, and then north of the province. And we had these massive ones. I don't know what in terms of how large that one is, but uh, the fact that they are large means that they have to have the grid capability to handle um, the the uh, what do they call it? wattage or voltage? I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so that so that means you have a fairly large coal plant in New Brunswick. I, I think it's 300 megawatts. Um, oh, okay. I, I might be wrong, but it's around that. It's not a huge, huge. Um, but it's, and there's it's no a, talk about maybe, phasing that out right now, right? Oh, there absolutely is. Yes, yeah. the um, okay. the federal government have given the mandate to have coal, no coal by 2030. Okay. Uh, Nova Scotia has a lot more coal. I, I, I think it's an. I don't know exactly. And maybe one to one and a half gigawatts even. Um, uh, it's certainly a bigger challenge for Nova Scotia, and the federal government has said. Coal needs to be gone by 2030, um, and all power decarbonized by 2035, I believe it is. So this is a this is a big challenge, and this is okay. one of the reasons that um, New Brunswick is is looking at nuclear would be to replace coal. Interesting, yeah. Uh, there's another um, topic that's interesting uh, is desalination of water, and um, the, uh, the, again, we're getting into how you could do um, a hybrid or uh, other multi-purpose uh, plant, but um, desalination. And another thing that I don't know enough about, but I'd like to know more, is sewage and how you deal with that. Um, like uh, I know that a lot of Ontario, a lot of Canada is criticized because they have sewage going directly into the local water supply rather than have a treatment. And it's, they're kind of slow about, they've made some kind of uh, almost too, um, uh, too lenient, I suppose, where they um, don't Im impose any kind of fine or anything until tw they say 2030 is a kind of a estimated time when they would clamp down on issues with, Sewage. Is there any? Uh, do you know if there's any hybrid or um, solution with nuclear work that could help handle sewage? I actually didn't know about that issue with sewage. So um, thank you for bringing that to light. I'll I'll I'll, I'll do some research on that to yeah to should, should know. Um, I, I mean, I, I, so I don't know. Obviously, low cost clean energy is usually useful to many industries yeah. and sectors so probably to sewage treatment too but i uh yeah I, 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 um yeah. so if you got high temperatures that can purify certain things i can imagine that being beneficial um now the other thing i suppose yeah desalination we don't we have lots of fresh water in canada but we look just down to the states and um and they still have plenty of coal plants they still have plenty of reason for for uh wanting a moltex reactor um so I think uh, you'd be a very good fit for the American scene. Uh, <laughs> you agree? We think so too. <laughs> and, and, and America has um, has the most spent fuel in the world. It has twenty five percent of the global spent fuel stockpiles because uh, they're the biggest nuclear producer in the world and have been for quite a long time. Um, so they're a very important market to us, and they have a much bigger spent fuel issue than Canada. I see Canada has a plan to deal with its spent fuel. We're just proposing a proposing a, a better alternative. Um, in the U.S., or a, a better supplement to that plan, in the U.S., there is no plan. Uh, so we can really add even more value there because it's... Um, yeah, it, and they... It's really, they need to do something to, to running, their new nuclear... Plant. Apparently, their, their uh, use of water from the lower uh, underground... Um, is so high that it's affecting the sea level. I've heard. Um, but uh, but I mean, um, being able to get clean water from the ocean, you would think uh, like drinkable water. You would think that the desalination would be a good match for your plants as well. Well, what's very scary is the Colorado River. I mean, there's a huge portion of the states relies on the water from the Colorado River, and it's no water gets to the gets to the sea the uh, estuary is dry yeah it's all taken by the various states as you get there and the levels are are, are just going down and down and uh, they're getting very close to deadpool um that's that's a 
pretty scary. Yeah. So I think they're going to need. And the and the water somehow finds its way to the ocean, the the waste or the reused or recycled water, and um, it's not going back into the rivers, I guess. Um, That's right. And uh, but uh, yeah, so I could. I, I was just thinking that uh, we're likely going to see uh, partnering up with nuclear uh, reactors for desalination. I think. I think so. Yeah, it'll be the Middle East will be the first customers with that technology. Yeah, um, they, they they need it more urgently. Um, the technology for desalination is there. You just need a, a low cost electricity. Yeah, that that brings up an interesting question. Have you had um, uh, any uh, uh, companies from Europe or Middle East or China or that taking interest in the Moltex? Um, uh, yeah, very regularly. Um, yeah. Now, not so much China, thankfully, recently, but um, the I think most European countries have reached out to us in the last couple of years. Interested, uh, the ones with with waste issues have uh, been in touch. Um, we were interacting more with Asia uh, before. We, we that hasn't been recently, but certainly um, customers with waste a waste issue are desperate for this solution. Okay, yeah. they. They are. There is a huge customer pull for this. Um, they're all waiting to see the New Brunswick facility demonstrated, and and, and they're on board. I they're imagine very yeah. Japan looks customer. like a good match too. Japan, absolutely. Yeah. Japan, I think, is about the maybe fifth, fourth, or fifth uh, amount of stock, spent fuel. Mm. So our market categories are really ranked by the amount of spent fuel a nation has, as long as they're a friendly nation. Okay. Yeah, this has been an enlightening conversation. Thanks. And um, yeah, I, I guess we should start thinking about some uh, summing up what maybe we might have missed in in uh, my questions. Um, how do you how do you think? Uh, what did, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I think in in summary, we are the only ones looking at holistically dealing with spent fuel. The only ones looking at who have a, a combined solution of a cost-effective, safe way to deal with spent fuel, recycled spent fuel, coupled to a reactor that's designed to use that spent fuel efficiently and ultimately reduce the amount of spent fuel that exists. So our model is to produce affordable electricity, reduce the waste liability, and enable a larger rollout of nuclear as we get towards net zero because we're increasing the social license of nuclear power. Great. Yeah, I like that use of the word holistic. That, that uh, explains a lot. And um, uh, yeah, I hope the rest of the uh, what viewers will pick up on that point. Uh, great having you, Rory. And uh, look, maybe one day we'll have you again and we'll talk about some more uh, progress and what you're up to. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I love doing a deep dive in the technology. So thanks very much for having me. It was okay. uh, excellent to speak with you. Okay. Bye for now.